Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest this week is mastering engineer Kevin Gray. But first of all, and this subject is appropriate mostly because Kevin Gray works mostly in vinyl, the three-inch vinyl single is back. Well, he probably never knew that it was here in the first place, right? Jack White's Third Man Records, his record label, is releasing a number of three-inch singles. Now, this is a recent phenomena started in 2004 in Japan. When you think of three-inch, you think of something that might have gone back to the 50s, but no, this is pretty recent. When Jack was in the White Stripes and they toured Japan, he happened to see these things, and he brought them back, and then they actually released the White Stripes project as a three-inch single and the player and the single now actually goes for as much as two thousand dollars on ebay so there you go now this three inch single actually is going to have a brand new crossley rsd3 player and it's going to launch later this week during record store day with the number of singles this player itself and only does three inch singles is about 70 bucks the three inch single is interesting because it's kind of like a combination cd and vinyl record in that It's vinyl with a plastic substrate, very much like a CD. It only plays on one side because of this, and it's only three minutes worth of music. But it is kind of interesting. So what we're going to see pretty soon is three-inch singles from the White Stripes, the Raconteurs, Jack White, and the Dead Weather. And the Epitaph label is also going to do a number of three-inch singles by the Interrupters, Culture Abuse, Rancid, and Bad Religion. So this is going to be a collector's item because I can almost guarantee it's not going to catch on. That being said, it is kind of unique. When it was brought out in Japan, originally it was something called the 8-Bon, and it was more or less a toy. This is more than a toy. It's a serious format, but it's difficult enough getting singles in the marketplace and getting people interested in them, let alone a 3-inch single. So be on the lookout for this during the next record store day. You should see a number of them around. It should be interesting, and it should be interesting to see exactly how well they sell. So we'll be looking out for that, the three-inch single on Jack White's Third Man Records. If you have any questions or comments, you can send in the questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Also, get an expert analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. <laughs> Now here's something interesting, and it may be the future of music education. Concert violinists are being trained by artificial intelligence. The reason why is you can't just be good enough to be a concert violinist. You have to be the best of the best. So researchers at Spain's Pompu Fabra University have come up with an algorithm using machine learning that analyzes bow technique specifically for violinists who intend to be concert violinists. And this can recognize the accuracy up to 94% and give real-time feedback. The interesting thing here, I think, is this may end up being the future of music ed. Now, can it take the place of a real music teacher? Perhaps. Perhaps it can be better in certain ways, especially when it comes to technique and spotting problems with technique and helping you perfect your technique. Now, when it comes to feel, when it comes to psychology, when it comes to things that are a little bit deeper than just playing, then I think an instructor is always going to be better. But this may have some future. It's not something that's going to be here tomorrow. This is only still a research project, but it's being used, and apparently it's been somewhat successful at least. But look to this to be more used in the future in music education. I think this is going to be the way things are going to go. My guest today is mastering engineer Kevin Gray, who specializes in vinyl disc cutting. Kevin has mastered music for every major record label and every genre. 
His credits include more than 100 top 10 and Grammy award-winning records and dozens of gold and platinum albums and singles. In the interview, we talked about why he doesn't take super compressed projects, the custom design analog gear he uses, direct-to-disc recording, half-speed mastering, and much more. I spoke with Kevin via phone from his studio in Los Angeles. The way I understand it, you started in mastering really early in your career, which is unusual. Well, yeah. I mean, that was my first job in, in audio. Um, yeah, I started in 1972. <laughs> 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 yeah, back when vinyl ruled. <laughs> yeah. Well, how did you get the gig? How did that happen? Well, um, a guy moved into our neighborhood when I was first starting high school, um, and he had a mastering facility in, in Hollywood. His name is Bob McLeod, spelt the Scottish way, M-A-C-L-E-O-D. And he... Uh, was the owner of Artisan Sound Recorders in Hollywood. And um, I was totally, you know, interested in audio and electronics and had built my own component stereo and all this good stuff. And I walked into his living room and he's got, you know, big Altec voice of the theaters in the, in the walnut enclosures and, you know, nice turntable and amp and stuff. And so, you know, I, I, I said, gee, what do you do? And he said, oh, I do mastering. And so, make a long story short, he took me down and uh, to the facility to see it a few weeks later. And um, this is, you know, uh, early in 1969. I was, I was uh, still in my first year of high school. And uh, so, the minute I walked in the door, I was impressed with all the cool equipment. And, you know, I threaded up a tape and stuck a lacquer on and started cutting. And I said man, this is what I want to do for a living. It was just a halcyon moment, you know? Yeah. You know, again, that's unusual because most mastery engineers are regular recording engineers first and then come to it sometime later in their career. So for you to step in right away, that's that's really unusual. But it's cool. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Um, hadn't really thought about it much. I mean, I, I really like mastering. I, I've done some mixing, and and I, and I like doing that. But, uh, you know, in 1972, when I started at Artisan, um, I was actually approached, approached by Tom Hidley to go to work for, for Westlake as a mixer. And it was a tempting offer, but I thought, you know, I don't want to be working on the same record for six months, uh, you know, 16 hours a day, six days a week. You know, I just, I don't want to do that. And uh, I kind of like the nine to five aspect of it and be, being able to hear a lot of different kinds of music. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, you know what? Since you started in 1972, I'm sure you have a really good handle on how mastering has changed through the years, especially with vinyl. Well, um, I I guess I have to approach this from my niche. Uh, You know, I mean, when vinyl went away, I I jumped into CD mastering like everybody else. And from the mid-80s to the early 90s, that's what I was doing. Um, and then one of my clients, a company called DCC Compact Classics that I did a lot of CD mastering for, uh, asked me in 1992, I was working at Location Recording Service in Burbank at the time, and they said, hey, does the lathe still work? And I said, yeah, the lathe still works. And they said, uh, oh, good, we're going to cut some vinyl. And I said, on what? And he goes, oh, we're going to start putting out vinyl again. And I'm like, you're kidding me, because, you know, as far as I knew, all the nails had been driven into the coffin of vinyl, (laughs) you know, and, uh, I mean, not by my wishes, but uh, it had just happened a couple of years before. And so, yeah, so they started putting out stuff like uh, Elton John's greatest hits and uh, the Eagles' greatest hits, and they sold like hotcakes. And so they were back in it full swing. So I kind of jumped back into, well, I was doing both. I was doing you know CD and, and vinyl. But when you talk about techniques, I mean, you're talking about nowadays mastering for digital workstations and kind of like that sort of thing going to yeah lacquer yeah 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 I, you know I, I i try to keep the whole process analog if if i had my my choice that's what i'd be doing and that's a big chunk of what i do i uh, i'm still working from from quarter inch and half inch uh, 1530 ips master tapes on a good percentage of the stuff that i do probably more than just about anybody in town um, and I get, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still vetted to receive master tapes from a lot of the labels that really aren't letting them out to most people because I just, I've been in the industry long enough and I know all these people and I have a good rep with them. So, um, so my, my gig's a little bit different than most, but yeah, I mean, I, I have a Sonic Solutions, uh, you know, digital workstation and a Mac computer and, and I, I do stuff off of 
digital files when that's what they send me, when that's the either the best they have or, the, or what they're willing to send out. Reissue work is kind of my niche. Yeah, yeah. 50s, 60s, 70s, jazz rock and, and uh, classical. Now, that being said, so you get a lot of analog tapes in. What condition are they usually in? Well, everything prior to the 70s is great. Um, usually there, there's, there's no issues. They, um, they play perfectly and they don't shed and they're great. But anything that was done on 406 or 456, if it hasn't been baked by the label, I generally have to bake it before I can cut it. And I have a convection oven here, dehydrator, whatever you want to call it, for doing that. And, um, and so, yeah, I spend <laughs> a lot of my background time doing that stuff. Do you do a digital master at the same time? Often I do. Um, actually, it's interesting. Most of the reissue labels that I'm doing work for, you know, the guys who are licensing from the majors, want to do SACDs. And I think I've done more SACDs than just about anybody. I've done over 300 of them. Wow. I kind of lost count. Yeah. Oh. So, yes. So we've, we've done SACDs on, on a lot of the stuff that we've done for final. And I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of high res now for download. You know, a lot of stuff, 2496 and 24192. Do you approach an SACD project any differently? I don't. I don't. I kind of have one set of ears, and I kind of do everything for that. I mean, there's certain limitations with vinyl. There's certain small things that I might have to do slightly differently for the vinyl, but I, I try to keep it pretty similar, you know, same EQ, and I try not to compress stuff at all because I, I have a feeling that's why a lot of the buyers want vinyl because they're, they're getting the stuff full dynamic range. I saw on your website that you had a uh, a very specific request of your clients <laughs> about loudness, or actually, it, diatribe. <laughs> it, it wasn't a request as much as it was um, a, a commentary. A commentary on on how you work. Yeah. Well, I was basically telling people, if you want the thing really compressed, don't send it to me. You know, don't don't waste my time or yours. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I, I I put that up there, and it's very interesting because. I still do some high res projects, an occasional CD. I'm, you know, I probably do what five CDs a year anymore. But I do a lot of high res stuff, and for people who want to keep it in a more, you know, quote unquote audiophile uh, format, um, where it's not compressed, like jazz projects, and and uh, and I do a lot of jazz. It's kind of what I'm probably best known for nowadays. What I always find interesting, if you go to a trade show of any kind or a hi fi show. The speaker manufacturers are usually playing material that's very uncompressed, and everybody's always raving about how great it sounds, and yet the vast majority of material that goes out into the world these days is just the opposite. Kind of ironic. It is, um, but that, that opens up a niche for guys like me. You know, if, if i I got to be honest with you. If I had to sit all day and do super compressed stuff, I'd, I'd rather be selling real estate or something. I mean, I, I, I couldn't see myself staying in the biz if that's what I had to do. Um, you know, I worked at FutureDisk Systems from 94 to 2001 and uh, loved the company, loved the people, but an awful lot of what I was doing, I was having to compress the snot out of, and I, I just I didn't appreciate doing that. And then a lot of stuff that I was cutting was rap and dance music from really highly compressed files. And... I was just sort of like, oh, God, can you get me out of this? <laughs> can I get into something else, you know? And then an opportunity came up, the pressing plant record technology up in Camarillo that uh, a lot of records go to contacted me when I was at FutureDisc and said, hey, could you come in and work one night a week for us uh, cutting stuff that people send in? And so I went and I asked the powers that be at FutureDisc, and they said, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I did that one night a week, and then they're asking for two nights a week, and pretty soon they're asking for two nights a week and one day of the weekend. And when they started going for three nights a week, <laughs> I finally said, are you sure you don't want to just hire me? <laughs> and so they did. And, and they had a mastering facility up there called Acoustic Mastering built on the premises. And um, I eventually wound up putting my, you know, they sold off their gear, and I put my gear in there, which was going to be my buy-in to the company, but for a lot of reasons I won't go into, it never actually happened. And so, uh, well, one of the owners actually left and started his own pressing plant. So that, that was kind of the end of that. Oh, yeah, there you go. Well, speaking of gear, let's talk about that for a second, because you have um, some custom-made stuff, right? It's almost all custom-made as far as the analog gear. Um, 
most of the digital gear is, you know, I've had some power supply upgrades and stuff like that, but it's all pretty much like it is. But the analog system was all built from scratch. Uh, my whole mastering console, um, the equalizers, the limiters, um, and, and the electronics in my tape machine, and then the disc cutting system was built entirely from scratch. Um, it's not like a Neumann or Ortofon or anything else that's out there. Wow. Um, we, we did some pretty unique things in, in designing and building it. And everything in my system, from tape head to cutter head, is pure Class A transformerless, input to output, and all discrete. No ICs. Boy, you don't see that every day. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, it's the only it's the only system of its kind in the world. There's there's nothing else else out there like it. Do you have a lot of power to the cutter head? Uh, I have 300 watts per channel, and uh, you don't need any more than that. I mean, as a matter of fact, the the groove actually clips when you get up to about 160 watts. So anything more than that is really a waste. So. You know, I got about 3 dB a headroom over that for yeah. what it's worth. I forget who I was talking to who um, was a cutter as well, who was in the thousands of watts and claiming it was all the headroom that they needed and whatever, and the more yeah. watts the better. So I don't know. Teach no, that's... Well, you know, it, the, the, what started the whole thing was that Ortofon came up with a 500-watt system back in the 70s and... or uh, uh, Yeah, late 70s. And Ortofon fo- or Neumann followed with 600 watts. You know, it, it, it got to be the old numbers game. And um, they were talking about how they could cut a tone burst at 105 centimeters per second. Well, but that bears no relationship to anything musical that's on a record. Yeah. You know, it just, there's nothing that uses that kind of power. It's ridiculous. You've done a lot of direct-to-disc, haven't you? I've probably done as many or more than anybody. I've done over 30 of them, yeah. You know, to me... Doing direct-to-disc is very much like doing jingles. And I say that because basically, no matter what, you know, if the gear is broken, doesn't matter. You have to go ahead and nobody knows it. And you've got an hour to cut your tracks and an hour for vocals and an hour to mix, and then it's out the door. So everything is very time compressed. Right. When it's a direct-to-disc project, it's very similar in nature. I mean, it's not identical yeah, to that. Live, but, but it, yeah, it's live. What yeah, it's live. What happens, happens. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I and I, you know, it's a high pressure thing, but I kind of enjoy it. It's it's an adrenaline rush. It's a lot of fun. It's it's well, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of fun. It's a, it's a real uh, sense of accomplishment when you're done. When you've got a complete side, and everything went okay, you know, musically, and you got it on the record. Uh, of course, you don't really know until you get a test pressing, but <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 pretty cool. Um, I did my first one in 1977 with uh, Victor Feldman, if you know who he oh, was. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Um, yeah, well, Victor, you know, had, had just come off of playing on Steely Dan Asia and a bunch of stuff like that, and so I actually cold-called him. I got his phone number from the Musicians Union and said, hey, I want to do a direct-to-disc recording. Would you be interested? And he goes, oh, I've done a lot of those. I don't know. And I said, well, I'm talking about as a leader. And he goes, oh, really? And I went, yeah, you know, you'd, you'd be the guy. And <laughs> long story short, he called me back about a week later and said, yeah, let's do it. So I did two with him, one on my own label, which was called Coherent Sound, and then the second one I did uh, through Nautilus, who had distributed the first one. And uh, and then from there, I started doing, you know, Chad Kassam back in Salina, Kansas, the guy who owns QRP, the record pressing plant, and Acoustic Sounds, which is a big purveyor of vinyl and and hardware, Um, they... uh, they built a studio in, in an old Gothic church. And uh, so he started having these blues festivals every year and he would get the guys who were, he, he wouldn't do a live recording of the blues festival, but he'd get the guys who were performing at the blues festival to do a direct to disc recording when they were back there. So that's, that's how I got the quantity so high. You know, I was going back every year for like the better part of 10 years and we'd do two or three oh, or I see. four, yeah, yeah, yeah. But whatever we could fit in on the weekend. Have you ever done the half speed mastering? I have. I've experimented with it. Not a fan of it at all. I, I think it's the biggest joke that was ever purveyed on the audiophile market. It it actually has more limitations than than benefits, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you're cutting all the frequencies in half, which is great for the high end, but it sure doesn't do much for the low end. Um, uh, you know, you're losing an octave on the bottom, and um, the head becomes underdamped at very low frequencies, half speed. On the high end, you've got the problem of what do you do with vocal sibilance and stuff like that? Because 
cutting at half speed, the resulting groove is the same, and it's it's not a cutting problem, it's a playback problem. So the groove has the same problems whether it's cut half speed or full speed in terms of playback. So, you know, there's no way to do high-frequency limiting or that sort of thing. Now, if you took a digital file and corrected it digitally, then you could cut that to half speed, and that might actually have some benefit. But uh, in the analog domain, uh, I don't see it. And I did lots of shootouts with the JVC Cutting Center back in the in the uh, early 80s, and I won every single one of them. I mean, it was just hands down. There was no comparison. So this was after I'd built my Class A system. So I don't know. Maybe people were having problems with the slew rate of the amplifiers and that sort of thing in, in the older Neumann systems, or well, even the, the later Neumann systems. Um, they had more power, but they didn't have the slew rate. And uh, maybe cutting half speed, it, you know, got rid of some of those problems. The reason why I bring it up is I just saw that Abbey Road was offering it, and there was a big deal. Mm-hmm. It was a video and, and everything about yeah, the I, benefits. I, I've seen it. Nah, I don't. I don't see it in the analog domain. I really don't. I mean, it's it's inferior every every time I have have had any shootout with anybody or I've experimented with it, uh, which I haven't done really since the late seventies. But because uh, we were when we were looking for a better mousetrap, quote unquote, which is why we what led us to build this system from scratch. You know, we were thinking about half speed. We were thinking about tubes. We were thinking about a lot of different ideas. And uh, so we started making some comparisons and things. And this was the road that it led us to. And full speed actually seemed to be, in, you know, better in all of the comparisons that we made. Mm-hmm. How about monitors? What are you using? It's a custom system that I designed literally back in the 80s. The drivers have changed slightly, but the the basic idea is the same. I'm using uh, Dyne Audio mid-ranges and uh, and and. Mid-range, dome, mid-ranges and dome tweeters, um, and uh, the mid-bass and the sub-bass are JVL. It's a four-way system, um, tri-amplified. I have a passive crossover between the mid-range and the tweeter, but the rest of it's all active. And, um, you know, I, I got lots and lots of watts driving that, and um, it, it sounds pretty damn good. Um, clients have been very pleased. Oh, they say it's much easier to relate to my system than most of the other systems in mastering studios. They say, hey, you know, when I get it home, it sounds pretty much the same as what I'm hearing here, which is great. You know, so. a lot of these guys have got they've got a hundred thousand dollar audio file systems at home. You know, so yeah, yeah, right. What are you using to power the speakers in? Well, back in the mid '70s, my my former business partner, a guy named Doug Shepard designed uh, a power amplifier. Uh, it's it's a very simple bipolar discrete power amp, full comp push pull. Um, and basically we made a class A version of, of that to drive the cutting head. We're using a class A B version of the same amplifier to drive the speakers ah. each, each part of the range. Got it. And how about cable? Are you using anything special? Well, I do because, <laughs> uh, so how do I say this discreetly? Well, audio quest basically provided me with cable in exchange for advertising for it. And obviously I did the listening test to decide that I was happy with it before I put it in the system. But my whole system from monitors to, you know, in the interlinks between uh, the tape machines and the console, the console and the cutting electronics, the console and the digital gear, it's all AudioQuest. Uh, they're top of the line stuff. It's it's like $80,000 worth of cable. Wow. Cool insane <laughs> i would think that you would be able to hear it including it. power cables. <laughs> yeah yeah no i i'm hip to that definitely and, and frankly i've tried that as well i bought into the the snake oil or i thought it was snake oil and and you know i can hear the difference so um mm-hmm. whether it's a placebo or not i can hear something that i like so uh you know i continue to right to use well it. i yeah. i agree with you and it's like i, I don't know if you need eighty thousand dollars worth but uh yes cables do make a difference I'll, I'll jump on board and say that. Now, that being said, you have the perfect system to be able to tell because it's one of those things where it's the, the weakest link of the chain. And if your weak link is someplace else, the cables aren't going to matter you know, a whole lot. But in your case, right. you should be able to hear things a lot better, I would think. Well, yes. And, and it was very interesting because I cut some 12-inch reference acetates before and after and didn't tell anybody which 
track was which. You know, I, I, I put the same piece of music on there with the old cable and with the new cable, and I cut them so that on one disc the, it would be on the outside, the other disc it would be on the inside, so there was none of that kind of difference you know, being shown up here. So I, I cut like six of these acetates, and I sent them out as a set to uh, most of my high-end clients, and I was shocked. Every single person nailed it right. That's the old cable, that's the new cable. That's the old cable, that's the new cable. That's the old cable, that's the new cable. And, you know, because I, I made a record of which was which. I just called them X and Y on each disc. But nobody but me knew which was X and which was Y. That blew me away. You know, I mean, I heard the difference and I thought it was subtle. These guys were claiming, oh, no, it's not subtle at all. It's like, okay. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, that tells you something right there. Go <laughs> getting around that. It was 100%. There was, no, there was no, you know, 90, 70, 80, you know, when the numbers get down around 50%. It's guesswork, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. But, I mean, it was 100%. Everybody got them right, and I was shocked. Kevin, with the newfound infatuation with vinyl and the numbers still growing, where do you see it all going? Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> you know, we have so many new plants coming online. Sony's building a new plant in Tokyo. Um, there's now companies making record presses again. There's nobody making a lathe currently, but there's a lot of them out there. Um, there's, uh, 60 pressing plants in the world now, I think, which has almost doubled from a decade ago. Wow. Or at least 2005, I think. So it's a little over a decade, but, um, I, it seems like it's growing. It seems like it's going to continue to grow, but, but the problem is we do need the additional capacity because right now, uh, it's getting bogged down. And I kind of predicted that when the major labels all jumped back in, it was going to muddy up the water. And it has, unquestionably, because they're going for much bigger quantities and, you know, more and more stuff. And by doing that, it, it really bogs down the pressing plants. Um, I think the biggest problem is, it, it is not at, at mastering or plating. It's, it's at the, uh, the actual pressing end. Is it hard to get good vinyl? There have been so many inroads into that in the last few years. Most of it's coming out of Thailand. Um, the main company over there, TPC, just does wonderful, wonderful work. Um, and they experiment with two or three of the pressers trying to come up with new formulations and things to get it even quieter, harder, you know, better, you know, something that will last and, and, and sound great. And I think they've been doing a magnificent job. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been something to watch. See, that's about the last place I would have expected vinyl to be coming from. Well, you got to remember, it's got to be outside of the country because of all kinds of you know issues with polyvinyl chloride. You know, sure. sure. <laughs> so, the company I think was originally, well, two of the principles I think actually came out of Kaiser, which was the largest manufacturer. K, it's K E Y S O R. But they were the largest manufacturer of vinyl in the U S. And so I think basically they took what they knew and went to a country that was a little more friendly about the whole thing, and they, you know, put their input into it. It wasn't like a bunch of little Thai guys coming up with this stuff. It's, it's uh, some old school people who really know what they're doing. Yeah, in an OSHA friendly country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or non OSHA, right. basically. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know how to quite how to look at that. Yeah. I was just in Malaysia. I was in Kuala Lumpur and, and Penang. In Penang, it was interesting because going from the port where I was to Kuala Lumpur, you passed all these factories that had this very acid-like industrial smoke coming out of them, and they were unmarked factories. Yikes. Uh-huh. And I thought to myself, there's something very funny going on here, but you know, no one <laughs> seems to, to worry about it. So... I get home and I look in the Times and there's an article all about the fact that China is no longer taking our recyclables. They basically have enough of their own so they don't take our recyclables and in fact they're going to Malaysia instead. And what I passed was a number of illegal recycling houses. The only way they can get rid of it was to burn it. And in fact that's what everybody was smelling. And I can only imagine what the health hazard must be. Oh my gosh, yes. The, the reason why I bring it up is the fact that, yeah, when you're working with vinyl, I mean, it's PVC, so it's much the same thing, although not in the same dimension, I guess, as, 
you would have that in you know when it comes to recyclables but that's nasty stuff yeah. and especially in the chemicals yep. when you're making parts that that's nasty stuff too yep well, it's caused most of the platers to move out of California, too. I think the only companies that are doing record plating, you know, to, to turn the lacquers into the metal parts that they stamp from, are, are, are companies that were grandfathered into it that already preexisted in California because um, California is very unfriendly to heavy metals. You know? I didn't realize there was any left. I thought they all had gone. Most of them have. Uh, all the aerospace-type companies left, like in the 80s or 90s. Yeah. You mentioned about... There are new pressers coming online, and I've seen press releases for these. They must be better. They would have to be, you would think. You're talking about the companies or the or the, the, the record press? The record itself. press. The record press. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the only company is in, jeez, I'm trying to remember. It's somewhere in Eastern Europe, I think, the company that's doing it. It's called, um, there was a company called Fine Built here in the U.S., and I think they're copying that press. And it has a play on that, on words on that. I can't remember what it, like, well-built or <laughs> yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Wasn't there um, one out of Canada as well? I don't know. I'm not as familiar with record presses as I am with the earlier <laughs> part yeah. of the chain. Yeah, I got it. Got um, it. I mean, the, 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 the big three in the U.S. were always uh, SMT and two, uh, uh, Alpha Tulex, which is not American, but, I mean, a lot of the American companies were using them. They were made in Sweden, I think. And then the other one is, uh, well, Fine Bill, and uh, who am I forgetting? But anyway. What's one thing that most people don't know about mastering that you wish they knew? <laughs> well, it would make my job easier if people were a little more aware of some of the limitations of vinyl, which is not to say that you can't make a good-sounding record out of almost anything, but um, if people kind of knew that you can't really put the womp and womp and low bass and the and the, the the tizzy top end that has become so popular on CDs onto vinyl without modifying it. You know, it, it would make my job easier because, you know, you kind of get it. I'll, I'll get a thing where a guy will send me a thing, and before I cut it, I'll always call him and say, by the way, you know, when you get the record back on this, it's not going to sound exactly like the CD because you got... Usually it's more top end on there than than will play back cleanly. It's not a cutting problem again; it's a playback problem. So, I, but I think in the last decade, more and more guys who are jumping back into vinyl are now becoming aware of it. But you know, it was a problem. You know, back in in 2008, you know, people were saying, "Well, geez, why why doesn't the record match my CD?" And I said, "Because of this thing called physics." <laughs> you know? I guess you don't have a problem with getting things in that are too loud. No, I can always turn them down. I mean, I prefer it if it's not super compressed because the problem with compression is you're almost creating square waves, you know, yeah. on 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 the file, and you're trying to translate that onto vinyl, and it's not friendly to vinyl. You know, it, it wants to see some rounding, somewhat sinusoidal-looking stuff, and... Uh, some of that goes away on, on highly compressed digital files. So, And, you know, that was really more of a problem with the rap and dance music, not so much pop. Uh, I, I would guess that there's kind of a misunderstanding about the time limitations as well. Yeah, uh, that, yeah you, I'm glad you mentioned that, because that's the one thing I forgot to mention and was going to, is, um, yeah, I, I try to tell people, if you really want the best-sounding record, keep it to 16 to 18 minutes aside. Now, I know that seems rather short in today's world where you got a 45 minute or longer CD, but uh, you know, I can cut 24 minutes, I can cut more, but the problem is the level's going to be down low enough that the surface noise is going to start to be noticeable on the record and there's nothing I can do about it. And also it's that whole thing of you drop the needle on the record and the way it impacts you, you know, where your volume is set at kind of your normal setting. Um, you know, you're not going to get that with a 24 minute side or, or, or longer. So, um, I tell people ideally 16 to 18 and try to keep it under 22, 24 max. And, uh, most people have worked with me on that or, you know, a lot, what a lot of people do is split it into a four sider, you know, make it a two record set. Oh, sure. Yeah. You know, one of the things I noticed the records that we grew up with and, and love that we might consider them legendary they were short. 
in the grand scheme of things yeah. as compared to today. I mean, Absolutely. you know, under 40 minutes, in many cases, you're talking 35, as you're saying, so it's it's perfect for, for vinyl, but no one ever complained. No one ever said, well, there's only seven songs on here, so, you know, I want my money back. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. For some reason, we got into this mindset that it has to be 10 songs or, you know, people are going to write in the streets or something. Mm -hmm. Well, five songs aside is still doable at 18 minutes. It's just that they're not going to be long songs. Yeah. (laughs) You know, three and a half minutes. What's that times? Yeah, around around there, sure. Yeah. That's around 17. Yeah. Okay. Last question, Kevin. What's the best piece of business advice? that you ever received from somebody or maybe you learned along the way? <laughs> Go into business for yourself. <laughs> you know, I, it's, it's kind of funny because I didn't open Coherent as a, it, I started Coherent as a company that was building uh, speakers, electronics, and, and, and that sort of thing for studio. And I, I opened it in 1982, and I did that as a side job while I mastered during the day. And I sold a lot of monitor systems. I sold a lot of uh, custom and sort of copy electronics. I, you know, I was building like 1176s and LA-2As before anybody was doing all of these, you know, clones now. Um, I was doing that, and I was doing it for some of my clients because I was doing some things to it that were improving it over the original. You know, if, if you want them stock, buy a stock one. But anyway, um, in 2008, I was working up in, in uh, Camarillo, uh, mastering at the mastering place that was at the pressing plant up there. It was called Acoustech Mastering. And I thought, why am I pounding my head against the wall, driving up here 45 minutes each way? I was working four days a week, Monday through Thursday, which is what I still do. And um, But I thought, you know, it's a lot of time on the road and whatever. And, you know, why don't I start my own facility? Because people had been telling me this for like a decade. You know, why don't you, know, why don't you just start your own place? So I did, and it's the best thing I ever did. I mean, I kind of, at this point, looking back, I kind of wish I'd done it earlier, but uh, I guess there's a time and place for everything, yeah. reasons why things happen the way they do. Is there anything that I haven't asked you that maybe you want to talk about? Uh, well, well, one question that a lot of people ask me, what's your favorite stuff that you've done remastering on? And uh, that's a broad subject, but I can name a few. I got to do the 30th anniversary uh, re- reissue of Dark Side of the Moon. We got the original master tape in to work from on that. Wow. Um, I got to do the, I guess it was the 50th anniversary reissue of uh, Miles Davis' Kind of Blue. Um, you know, so there's there's been some really fun stuff. Um, when, when Warner first got back into vinyl in 2005, I was doing all of their stuff. And um, they uh, we were doing stuff like Fleetwood Mac and James Taylor and Van Morrison and, you know, it was Joni Mitchell and, and, you know, that was, that was very fun. You know, I, I stopped asking that question because I kept on getting answers that would be, um, oh, I, I love them all. You know, the last one I did, (laughs) you know, stuff like that. So I was like, oh, okay, I won't even bother anymore. (laughs) Well, I don't love them all, but it's, I I guess it's good for me that I have a very uh, broad uh, taste in music, you know, there's not a whole lot I don't like, like, like the old adage, there's only two kinds of music, the good kind and the other kind. <laughs> you can find out more about Kevin and his mastering at coherent.com. That's C O H E A R A N T cohere com as in here coherent.com thanks for listening and being in my inner circle remember if you have any questions or comments send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com to listen to the episodes of bobby osinski's inner circle go to bobby and select the podcast tab or go to bobby or find it on itunes stitcher mixcloud google play google podcasts spotify deezer and now radio public at bobby and bobby ownercircle.com you'll also find a sign and for my newsletter and for alerts to new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. <laughs>